Dr. Amy, I think this is the first time you're coming on the Thyroid Fixer podcast. So I'm pretty pumped to have you on. And what we're going to talk about is key, key for my audience. So as we amp up to the biology of trauma 3.0, and if you guys are listening to this in the beginning of August, 2023, you get to get in on this. We'll give you the details at the end. If you're listening to this after, it doesn't matter. Everything that Dr. Amy and I are talking about today is pertinent, key, key for your health, key for optimization of your thyroid, your hormones, your immune system, your adrenals. And we're going to get into this. So Dr. Amy, thank you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Super excited. So you've been, I mean, you have quite an extensive history. I mean, to, to say that you are brilliant is an understatement. You are a trained MD. You've gone down the rabbit holes of examining how trauma has an effect on the body, how stress has an effect on the body. I'm using those terms interchangeably, interchangeably but I'm going to have you break them down for the audience. But can you first start off by telling us a little snippet of your story of what even led you kind of away from conventional medicine and into this kind of psychological realm, trauma realm? How'd you get here? Yeah. So, I mean, my whole thing is actually trauma is not psychological. It's all, it's all our body. It's all biology. And, and I had to learn that. So it was actually during medical school. I just finished my master's in biochemistry and had a few months of break before I jumped back into my third year clinical rotations for medical school. And I decided to become a foster parent. And so I jumped through all those hoops, did all the long list of things you have to do to your house. And just as I was going back into the clinical rotations, the call came. And this is a call that you never forget. And we had explored some other children that they needed placements for, but this is the one that, that it was like the, the perfect fit. And so as they're telling me about Miguel, he's four years old. And he's been in this foster care system since nine months old. And even when he was placed in the foster care system, he already had a broken collarbone that he had never received medical evaluation for, had no records of any doctor visits. And so there was just this big gap of like what has been happening. And he had had a really rough time in the foster care system as well. He had some behavioral issues, some emotional issues. And so it was hard for him to be around other children, even other pets because of his anger and explosion sometimes. And so I did not have any other children. I did not have any pets. And so it just seemed like this perfect fit. And what I knew, what I knew is that he just needed love and stability he hadn't been able to have those. That's all he needed. And I, of course, would be able to give him that. And it wasn't until after I adopted him and started doing all this attachment therapies and bonding that I saw that things were getting worse, not better. And there was a moment in time, it was the uh, summer of uh, when he was five. So that summer of 2009, and we had just come from uh, outside. We were playing in the grass. It was hot outside as it is very hot in Southern California. And so our skin was all scratchy because the, the grass had newly been cut. And I'm sitting then in the rocking chair. Yes, I bought a rocking chair just for this. I sit in a rocking chair and he, his body, his five-year-old body is, is laying across my lap and his, you know, I'm cradling him and his neck is in the, or his head is in the, the crook of my arm and I'm looking at him and I'm just rocking slowly, thinking all these love thoughts towards him. Cause that's what I'm supposed to do is just have my eyes, just shower him with love. And as he looks back at me, he says, mommy, tomorrow I'm going to kill you. Not today, mommy, tomorrow. And he proceeded to tell me how he was planning to kill me. And it started with poking my eyes out. And what I had to learn was that trauma <laughs> becomes very much a part of our body's reaction, our body's experience, and it actually overrides our brain. 
It's not, it's not that trauma gets stored in our brain. It's that trauma gets stored in our body and our body just starts to have these reactions and then diseases if it's unresolved and it overrides everything that is logical to us. And so he knew that he was, I mean, he logically knew that he was safe with me and that I loved him. And yet that was also what scared him was seeing that love in my eyes, which is why he wanted to poke my eyes out. And that's how he would start. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I actually did believe him because he had already actually tried to kill me. And, and so at that point, like that was one of my lowest moments with Miguel and realizing that these traditional therapies that I had been relying on to help, help us and help him adjust and help him rise above his childhood were not working. And I needed to figure out what he needed for his healing journey. Now it's not a, it's not a necessarily a glamorous, pretty picture. It took us six long years, six long years to figure out the pieces that he needed. I obviously learned a lot in that process, but here's what happened. When I then went into my residency and I started with general surgery residency before I switched over to preventive medicine and addiction medicine, I started seeing attachment issues. I started seeing trauma reactions in all of my patients. And this was even just how they would talk to me or how they would explain their story or their symptoms or how they interacted with their, with their partner. If they were in the room, like this, this was, I was starting to pick up all of these signs that I had seen in Miguel because <laughs> I knew those very well, but now I'm seeing it. And I started to see how their symptoms were seeming to be associated with these body reactions of sadness and grief and anger and resentment that were also coming up. And so part of my story is that I got very sick in the process and had to go on my own journey and figure out like, can we even rewire trauma that has affected our biology and become our physical health symptoms, our chronic health conditions as an adult. Mm -hmm. And so all of that together has led, has led me here to where, yes, now I, I am certified functional medicine physician. And I take that and I apply that to all the different trauma therapies that both I have been through and I have gotten trained in and really being able to support the body in its experience of trauma, because it's, it's in everyone, like everyone, everyone to some degree has trauma stored in their body. Yeah. No, uh, I, I'm, I mean, my jaw's still on the floor. I've known you for a few years now and have never heard that story of Miguel. So that is, I mean, that's, riveting, that's I mean, <laughs> impactful, riveting. And most of us are here from a pain to purpose story. Most of us are in this space and we do what we do and we specialize what we specialize in because of something we've gone through. And now I can see why you are literally the leading expert in this field because of what you went through personally all those years ago. So wait, how is Miguel now? Because I know everybody's going to be wondering, like he's got to be what in his 19, 20, something like that. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He's actually 19. Mm -hmm. Part of yeah. our story, part of our story was that after those six years and he had his healing experience, uh, it was a very, very difficult, very difficult time. And he got a, adopted by another family. And so he's spent the last 10 years with that other family. Um, being able to have both a mom and a dad and siblings and pets and all of those things that, uh, that a, a kid needs growing up. So that was part of our story. Again, it's not, it's not necessarily, uh, the, the pretty and, uh, fairy tale ending of, of stories. Um, but it's been, um, one of those experiences that I feel like I gained so much mm -hmm. from Miguel. Yeah. And it's been, it's been awesome to see his continued growth. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. So we, I'm going to back up because we said, I said earlier, stress and trauma, and I use those terms interchangeably, but they're not, they're not. So can you break down the difference between stress that, you know, we say, oh my gosh, I'm just so stressed today and how that affects the body and then trauma and how mm. that affects the body. Yeah. And you're right. So many people also interchange those terms. 
And it, it, now that I know the difference, like it drives me crazy, <laughs> right? Cause yeah. I'm like, wait a second. No, are you talking about that was a stress for you or was that really a trauma for you? And we haven't known the difference. And I wasn't taught the difference in medical school. I'm sure that you weren't taught that difference. And so it's not something that we've understood, but we need to understand it. If we're going to start working with a body that has either been affected by stress or perhaps by trauma. So then we need, we need a quick definition of, well, then what, what is trauma? <laughs> what is stress and what is trauma? And for either one of those, it is the body's experience, the body's response to a situation. It's not the situation itself. It's not the event itself. And we see that all the time. We see two people go through the same event. Maybe two children grow up in the same family, right? And one comes out and they are traumatized. And another one comes out and be like, yeah, those were unhealthy dynamics, but they're fine. Yeah. And they go on to be able to bounce back and, and process some few things, but, but they're, they're good. And so it's not the event at all. It's that person's response and specifically their body's response to that event. So now we get to look at, well, then what is the body's response? What would a body's response be? That would be a stress response. And what would be a trauma response? And there are um, very key differences. When we have a stress response, this would be like uh, this would be like a firefighter. This would be like a policeman who gets that call that hey something's wrong, and they get this burst of energy from adrenaline, and it empowers them like it moves them faster than they will ever be able to move. They work out every day in the gym, and yet they are never as strong as in that very moment. <laughs> <laughs> when adrenaline is pumping through their veins. So that is a stress response. A stress response is a very high energy state and one in which we are taking action. It's actually impossible to not take action if the body is in a stress response. Let me say that again. Like it's impossible physiologically for our body to not take action if it is in a stress response, because that is literally what the adrenaline is forcing it to do. Mm -hmm. And so okay. the moment that a person, a body has either one of two perceptions, and these are perceptions. This is not whether it's real or not. This is just a perception. And one of those percep perceptions would be, is this too much too fast for me? Okay. If it's too much too fast, the body's going to shut down and go into a trauma response. It's not going to be able to respond with that action and energy. It's going to shut down. No, this is too much for me. I shouldn't even try. The other perception that a body can have is that I've had too little for just too long and I can't do it anymore. And again, it's that same body response of, I don't have, I don't have it in me to respond, but there's a fire going off. I don't care. I don't have the energy or maybe it's too little of love, too little of touch, too little of connection, too little of support. It's too little of anything that we have needed. And the body's just like, I have nothing left to give. I'm done. And all of the chaos can be happening around us that maybe we would have responded to before. And we are just like, I, yeah, no, I'm just, I got nothing. So yeah. those are the two triggers, the, the two, yeah, I want to call them triggers for the trauma response that will take a body from that moment of stress, like <gasps> something's wrong, but is it too much for me? Is this coming at me too fast? Or I'm already depleted. I'm already malnourished. I, I don't, I don't have anything to give to this stress response. And so I'm just going to go into overwhelm and shut down. And obviously, if you're already thinking about the body's physiology, that high energy and mobilization is a very specific physiology in our whole body. Mm -hmm. And it's very different than, mm, no, I'm just going to shut down. I'm not going to do anything. That's a completely different physiology. And we call that, um, this is actually the referring to the different states of our autonomic nervous system. And those states can switch in a moment of time based on a, a trigger that it perceives. 
And so that perception is guiding every moment. Do we have what it takes to fight this fire? Do we have what it takes to respond to this problem? Do we have what it takes to take action and figure this out, even though it's hard? Or, yeah, we're going to shut down. And those are different operating systems of our body. So I'll just pause right there before I go into the different operating systems. And, and uh, cause I know that I've just thrown a lot at you. Oh, well, no, I'm, I'm, I'm tracking. I'm following. It's funny though, when you said, when you initially said, and you were going to go into how the body responds, those two things, I thought you were going to say the threat of death. Mm. Like I thought that that was going to be the big thing that like when we perceive our lives are in danger, but it doesn't even have to be that big. It doesn't even have to be that bad. It can be anything. And, and you can correct me if I'm, if I'm not saying this correctly, it can literally be anything. And it's our perception of that thing and how our bodies respond to that thing. It doesn't even have to be your life is in danger. Right. Exactly. Right. You're exactly right. And, and yet when the body says, Oh, this is too much for me. It perceives that as a life threat. Okay. But you're right. It could be that someone looked at us the wrong way. And from our childhood that signaled to us, like, "Uh Oh, you're in trouble. You're going to get it later. And for us, like, that's too much right now. I can't handle that. And our body literally will go into a trauma response just from Uh someone looking at us the wrong way. So the body perceives it as a threat, Mm -hmm. but logically, right. Our brain will logically look at that and be like, that's not a threat. Like what's the problem, but our body has its own story. Our body has its own perception. We call that neuroception. We're literally our autonomic nervous system, which has its feelers out and collecting ever, information from everywhere. It perceives, it, it has its truth, if you want to say that. And so when it has its perception that mm, this is too much for us, it is also then claiming that because it's too much for us, this could be a life threat. And I need to shut down in order to protect you. And so a stress response, yes, is this idea that there is danger, right? Like there's a fire, there's something wrong, there's danger. And I'm going to respond to that danger and solve it. I'm going to do my best to solve it. That's the stress response. The trauma response of the body is when that threat feels inescapable. And it's inescapable because... I don't have the resources to fight this. I'm already depleted. I'm already malnourished. I don't even have enough magnesium. I don't even have enough thyroid hormone. I don't even have enough ATP. Like, so, so this feels inescapable to me, or maybe it's just that the stress feels inescapable. The stress has been going on for so long. It's not changing. And so the stress starts to become, or starts to feel inescapable. So there's all these elements that go into that final decision of our body, our autonomic nervous system to perceive something as too much for me, too much for me. This is too much for me. And we're going to shut down. Well, I know a a lot of the the listeners are resonating right now because of exactly what you just said, that it's too much for me because I've heard it. I've heard it directly from them. I've heard it from my patients that they've been dealing with this, whatever this is, the low thyroid function, low hormones, the symptoms that have no no name to them, no answer. They've been dealing with it for so long that they're almost at that give up state. And maybe they have given up, but yet they're still you know, listening, they're still reaching out for help, but they're almost at that, like no shit's given any more state and ready to give up. So it, it's making sense. I love how this conversation is going because as you're speaking, I'm thinking of individuals. I mean, even individuals, non-patients, even people in my life that I have relationships with and how they respond sometimes to things where I go, what, really? You're responding that way? But now you're making me take a step back and go, that's not a response to me or what I just said. That's a response to the stress and the trauma that that they are perceiving based on what I said, but it's triggering something from before. Exactly. I mean, you could go really deep, like you could go really deep here. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so, and so we can talk about emotional stressors. We can talk about chemical stressors and toxin stressors, and we can talk about our internal stressors and not having resources on a cellular level is a stress for the body. So even having a chronic health condition now also becomes a reason why the body will perceive anything is too much for me. Everything is too much for me. I can't respond to anything with that high energy because I don't have any energy to give. And so when we look at it as taking our eyes away from trying to find an event in our life that was a trauma and just being able to see like, this is, this is one of the responses that our body can have to life of just shutting down. And that shutting down is the trauma response. And that can happen very much when we have thyroid imbalances, <laughs> right? Like, because when we do like the body is literally saying, yeah, no, I've, I've, I've got this thyroid problem to deal with. Like, I don't have enough T4. I don't have enough T3. Like I don't have, I don't have what it takes. I don't have what you're asking to respond to this. And so everything starts to feel like too much, too fast or too little for too long. And so the body's, the body's going into a protection response, which is really the survival, survival protection, right? And I'm going to shut down to protect you because if you tried to go and fight this fire, solve this problem, you'd wear yourself out. You'd collapse. You would spend up all of our resources and we won't let you do that. We're going to help protect you. So we're actually going to protect you by shutting down and making you tired, making you not able to do things. Right. But of course that is also a stress for some people. <laughs> and yeah. so actually one of the most common patterns that I see in people who have stored trauma and this trauma response in their body is just that where they go back and forth between stress and a trauma response all in the same day. Okay. So that sometimes, and many people with a thyroid imbalance are waking up unless it's hyperthyroid. And then, and then they're very much in that stress and sympathetic, but otherwise many times they're waking up in their body in a trauma response. And they would recognize that by the thoughts that they have of, I don't want to get up. I don't want to start my day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm already overwhelmed by my day that hasn't even started. Right. My day already feels too much. Mm. That's that is your body in a trauma response. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing bad with that. It's just being able to notice that so that we can know what to do if our body's in a trauma response. But then here's what needs to happen. They're they're not able to stay in bed all day, right? Like they've got things to do. They've got whatever it is, work, kids, husband, like whatever it is, they've got things they have to get done. So here's what they end up doing. They end up going for caffeine. They end up stressing themselves out. They will procrastinate and wait in bed for as long as possible until now they really, really have to get up because they're going to be late. And when they do that, they, they are creating their own stress with adrenaline that the adrenaline will give them energy to literally pull them out of that trauma response for at least a few hours, but then they're stressed, right? And they're stressed and they're kind of, their thoughts are, are spinning and they feel a little scattered, but they're able to get things done. And then that wears off. And so now we're in early afternoon and it's starting to wear off and they start to feel that heaviness of their body going back into that trauma response and like, no, 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 we can't go there. We can't go into the fatigue. We can't go into the heaviness. And so they start snacking and they start snacking on things that will perhaps give them a sugar rush or perhaps that'll give them a histamine release because they're eating foods that they're sensitive to. Mm -hmm. And maybe they're reaching for more caffeine. Maybe they're trying to get some exercise in to stimulate their body to wake up. Like we can't, we can't fall back into that trauma response. But by the end of the day, when they come home, that's when they really are noticing that, ah, oh, that heaviness has come, has come back. And they, they really just want to sit, right? Like just want to sit on the couch. Perhaps they want to do things mindlessly because they don't, they don't want to use the energy to think that's what happens in the trauma response is that we want to just do things mindlessly. We need everything to be very easy and it feels so hard to move our body, even just 
five feet to go grab a glass of water. Like that just feels so incredibly hard. And so that's the most common pattern that I see with people with stored trauma is this back and forth between stress and that trauma response all in the same day. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're just dropping bombs here too, because how many of us, even in the functional medicine space always go to, well, the stress that you're under is affecting your adrenals, your thyroid, da, da, da. But now, I mean, the way that you're describing it, it's like just having that issue, having that thyroid issue is, it, it's like the opposite. It's that is affecting how you perceive everything else in your world. And yes. so instead of being an outside in, it's more like an inside outlook. Yes. And I'm going to go one step further. <laughs> and I'm going to say that this is still something where functional medicine is behind the game mm -hmm. because it's not stress that causes the adrenal problems, the mitochondrial problems, the thyroid problems. It's actually the trauma response. Yeah. Yeah. If we were able to maintain the stress response, we wouldn't have those problems. Those problems only come when the body switches its operating system and says, no, we need to shut everything down. We need to shut the adrenal glands down. We need to shut the thyroid down. We need to shut the mitochondria down because we need to go into an energy conservation state. We're needing to shut down everything in order to protect you from, so that you don't do anything, so that you don't overextend yourself. And so we've had this big misperception in, in all of medicine that the stress, right? Chronic stress will cause the adrenal fatigue. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't. It's yeah. the trauma response that turns on. And that is what communicates to the adrenal glands. No, like shut down the cortisol, sh sh shut it down. Like we, we don't want cortisol. And so uh, earlier on, a person can, can have high cortisol and still be in a, uh, spending a lot of time in this trauma response because it would be the equivalent of if we were driving a car and if you're driving a car, it also has kind of three operating systems, just like our body. And the parasympathetic is where we want to be. And that would be the equivalent of us cruising down the road. So windows are rolled down. Music is blaring. Our favorite song is on the radio. Like we we're feeling, we're feeling good. And our car is operating at its maximum efficiency of gas usage. So our um, everything is, is at its, at its best. Now at the moment we decide, oh my goodness, we're late for that appointment that we needed to go to guess what we're going to do. <laughs> that foot is going to go on that gas pedal. And we're going to start perhaps weaving in and through traffic because we've got to get to this meeting that is stress. And our car is not operating at its best anymore. Necessarily. It's going at its fastest, but not its best best because we're burning up a lot of fuel in the process. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing in our body. The stress response turns on our mitochondria. It turns on our adrenal glands. It turns on our thyroid to say like, Hey, you guys, we need energy. We need, we need to be revving up this engine to go, go, go. So let's kick this in gear. And all of these hormone systems kick in gear, but the minute that again, it's the body perceiving something and the body perceives, you know, I'm looking at our destination and my gas tank, and I don't think I'm going to have enough gas to get there if we continue at this pace. Or perhaps our car runs into a wall, or perhaps our body thinks that it might run into a wall. Like there's, there's so many different perceptions that will come in that will inform it. This is too much. We're not going to be able to sustain this. This is now becoming dangerous for our physiology to stay physically alive. Mm -hmm. our, we, we call that homeostasis in medicine. This is becoming dangerous for our, for our physiology. So I'm going to shut this down. Now, if we were driving a car, we do this, but our bodies are able to do this by itself. And that is the equivalent of throwing on the emergency brake. Mm -hmm. Now, the yeah. thing is, is that our foot may still be on that gas pedal, 
which means that cortisol may still be pumping for a time, but yet we have the emergency break on. And so the emergency break is stronger than the gas pedal. And so a person can still have high cortisol and yet be in this trauma response where the body has shut down. And that's where we get so many problems that we have high adrenaline and yet the body is not using it up. We have high cortisol and yet the body has shut down. And so it's not actually using that up. We call it metabolizing it. It's not, it's not metabolizing these stress hormones because we're shut down. Mm -hmm. And that's where all kinds of problems can start to happen. Oxidative stress, the immune system gets imbalanced. So the immune system even starts down this path of autoimmunity. We start to develop even long haul syndromes because the immune system is completely out of balance. It's getting the message from the cortisol to shut down, but it's getting the message from the trauma response to no, like we need to, we need to just have free reign and, and do anything because we don't have the energy to actually be selective about what we're fighting. Mm -hmm. And then it also, uh, kind of starts to shut down our digestion. It start it shuts down our liver. And so everything starts to go out of whack and we start to develop what are called syndromes where we have this constellation of symptoms. It's not just one thing. It's a constellation of symptoms that are kind of, they're just, ah, I just don't feel well. Well, what's wrong? Huh? Well, it's a little bit of this. It's a little bit of that. I'm not sleeping well. I'm not eating well. I'm not this. I'm not that, but ah, I don't know. Let, let me go see the endocrinologist. Let me go see the, you know, and, yeah. and, and we start to siphon ourselves off into these spaces, not realizing that we actually need to go upstream and just learn how to shift the body out of that trauma response, get the emergency brake off so that the car can come back into a place where it's operating efficiently and we can give it what it needs. And that makes sense. And so often I get asked the question, well, what, what caused this, you know, let's say take Hashimoto's what caused this. And we know that something turned the body into the opposition. It flipped the switch, right? Sometimes it's as simple as pregnancy because pregnancy is a stressor on the body on a multitude of levels, even though it's a natural thing that a woman's body was made to do it's a stressor. So we see often Hashimoto's turn on after a pregnancy, but so many people that haven't gone through that, they're searching for this, this root cause. And it might come down to, it sounds like it's very much coming down to in a majority of cases, trauma. Mm -hmm. And if they get all the way deep down and really start to deal with that stored trauma, then like you said, a multitude of symptoms, i.e. The, the big syndrome that they have will resolve itself. Now you still might need support. You still might need supplementation. You still, you still need the good lifestyle. You still need the nutrition aspect. You still might need thyroid hormones or, or bioidentical hormones, but you're going to get better and you're going to get more bang for your buck if you get all the way down and start to deal with that stored trauma. Well, here's, here's where my biology of trauma comes in, <laughs> right? Yeah. Because trauma, this trauma response causes a downstream effect on our biology, on our physiology, everything from what I listed, right? Like everything. the immune system, the endocrine system, everything. Right. But here's what happens at some point that biology will now keep our body in the trauma response because it's that same inflammation. It's now the it's the Hashimoto's, words. right? Mm -hmm. So now it's the Hashimoto's that's telling the body, like we we're under attack here. So we don't have anything to give you. Well, I've got this deadline coming up. Well, sorry. Like that's too much for us. Well, I've got this wedding to get ready for. Yeah. Sorry. Like I, I don't, we're under stress here. I have uh, we're under attack. Like I have nothing to give you. And so it's now, it's now our biology that will actually keep our body stuck in this trauma response. So just like you say, it's not going to be enough to, at this point, just go do some trauma work. And yeah. there, there is a very specific sequence that you need to do trauma work. So, so I'm not saying to go to a therapist right now, Please go to my, right go to my website and look, <laughs> look, look for my guide on the roadmap to identify and heal trauma. Um, but we also have to do 
the biology piece, because that will keep us stuck. And I have seen now so many people in trauma therapy and they are stuck they They've been in therapy for decades, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and, and they're still kind of rehashing the same things same thing. and thinking that this is normal. And I'm like, no, like it's your body is stuck in the trauma response because of your biology now. And so, yes, maybe that biology was a result of trauma, but now that biology is keeping your body stuck in trauma. And we have to look at your foods, your diet, your GI system. We have to look at your mitochondria. We have to look at your immune system. We have to deal with the autoimmunity. We have to, because that is what will hold you back now. Yeah. It's no, both. It's so, so like they have to do both. And that's, and that's where I've kind of come in and, and I've seen that there are three essential pillars for someone at this point, as an adult with a chronic health condition, like me, there are three essential pillars that we have to incorporate and integrate in order to rise above this. And that would be what I call somatic work. And somatic work is what allows us to start to learn how to shift our state so that I can learn how to shift my operating system, get out of that emergency break, even get my foot off that gas pedal and get into cruise mode, even if it's for just five minutes at a time, that's a good enough place to start. And that is actually where we have to start because our body is not used to that. It won't, it won't stay there. And, mm -hmm. and we keep needing to redirect it there. So somatic work is what allows us to actually start to become comfortable with connecting with our body and feeling our body instead of ignoring our body. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's this idea of becoming a compassionate witness to our body and creating a felt sense of safety for our body. Many times we're living in our body and we actually don't feel safe in our own body. We don't like our body. We don't like how it feels. We, we right. don't feel safe in our own body. And yet this is what we walk around in all day long. So that, that is an essential piece that bringing in safety so that we can shift our operating system, shift our body out of that trauma response. And then we need to bring in some of these, uh, how we talk to ourselves, how we treat ourselves. Are you still beating yourself up? Do you criticize yourself? Do you shame yourself? Are you putting yourself in the trauma response? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. You're not even needing other people to beat you up. You're doing it fine yourself. We've got to actually change that as well, because those are now things that our body responds to and be like, yeah, you're right. I'm just a failure. And I'm going to go right back into that shutdown mode because I'm a failure. So we do have to look at that piece and incorporate that. But then we have this biology piece and we've got to, we've got to integrate all of these pieces together. And that's how the body actually is able to come out of a chronic health condition when trauma is a part of that. A contributing factor. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, what can we do, but you just gave us some nuggets. I mean, it goes so much deeper, which is why you have a multitude of programs and you're doing this biology of trauma 3.0 summit. I mean, you bring in the, the experts in this field, but it, it seems very daunting. Is it, I mean, how long does it really take someone when you're working with them to start to see the progress and feel the progress in their body. Yeah. So what I've learned as a medical physician, I actually can't start with the biology piece. I need to give them three to six weeks of laying a foundation for them being able to shift their own state and learn how to provide a felt sense of safety and support for their body. Mm -hmm. And so I start with a 21 day journey. And in those 21 days, I'm just teaching them a different short two to five minute somatic exercise every day. But in that process, just in that 21 days, they're experiencing a 26% decrease in daily physical pain, 28% decrease in GI symptoms, 28% decrease in sleep issues, 30% decrease in fatigue, along with the 30% decrease in depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms. So the body, the body is more ready than we've thought. And it's been confusing because we've just been told a lot of different things and we need to go to therapy and talk it out. And that will never, that will never actually be what the body needs because every time that we talk about the story, our body goes into the story. And so we actually reinforce that trauma response. We need to get out of the story and actually just into our body, creating a felt sense of safety and support in the present moment. And those are the changes that are possible even in 21 days 
even with people who are 60, 70, 80 years old and have had health issues for decades. The body, the body is so ready. Wow. Wow. I mean, it, the, the entire time you've been talking, I've been thinking of patients, friends, like, you know what I mean? Like people that I know that are stuck, that it's like, oh my gosh, this is the key. Oh my gosh, this is the key. Like, this is the key to move that needle. And, and I'm speaking to the ones where maybe you've tried it all too. You know, you've done all the things, you know, the, the gut protocols and, and we have you on thyroid and hormones and everything, but it's just, it, it's not working. Something isn't clicking. And this is where as a practitioner, I go, I'm scratching my head. Like what in the hell is going on with this person? It's like their body has said, nope, not, not going to respond, not going to do it. Sorry. And in talking to you, Aim, I'm just, I'm seeing so many potential doors that can be open and changes that can be made in someone's body and quality of life. I mean, let's face it, you know, your quality of life exponentially increases as you go through your system, because in 21 days, those stats that you just said, oh my God. I mean, my listeners are right now like, I would pay for the 30% increase in, in energy and decrease in gut issues. Thanks. That'd be right? great. And, yeah. and, and when I saw those numbers, cause I started hearing all these things that people were saying, I'm like, I need to actually study this. So I started having people fill out assessments before and after, so I could get this data. And mm -hmm. when I saw the data, like I was blown away again, like I'm coming from a very conventional medicine background where you don't get these kinds of numbers, even with, with, with medications, or maybe there's a medication that will give you <clears throat> one symptom relief, but it'll cause some other side effects, right? <laughs> so right. to be able to see that like, no, this is like affecting, affecting multiple systems of your body all at the same time. It's like, yeah, like this, this for me, this is, this is medicine. This is why I went into medicine to truly help people live a better life and become healthier. I love it. I love it. So all the different things that they can do. I mean, number one, we'll have all of your information in the show notes, but number one, you have the biology of trauma summit starting this week. So that's this one, a yes. free opt-in. Yeah. So they can really learn a lot about you and everything you do and then hear from different experts. And then what, what else? Because what if it's after the summit, how can they connect with you? How can they get into one of your programs? How can they get the help that they need? Yeah. So they can go to my website, traumahealingaccelerator.com. And there they can find a guide that's called steps to identify and heal trauma. It'll be under the resources section on my homepage. That would be a good place to start. If what I've said today resonates with you, but you're still kind of like, mm, I'm not sure if I have stored trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, that will give you an assessment in there for you to start to look at the specific things that you can see in your life, in your relationships, in your health, and give you that kind of clear path forward. Like I talked about where we need to lay the foundation first. And if, if you're ready, if you're ready, if you're ready, like, you're like, yeah, this is me. And I need to lay that foundation. Then you're going to be looking for the 21 day journey and sign up for your 21 day journey with me. Yeah. Great place to start. And I'm going to encourage all of you to do so because I know you and I know the patients that are listening and I know my audience. I know that this is something that you need. That I think we all need. I, I think it should be mandatory, honestly, especially in starting in kindergarten, I think. <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, I mean, this this might have to become first before we do anything with thyroid and hormones, but um. Yeah, Aim, I, this has been just eye-opening. It's been uh, so interesting, so interesting, and really has my mind rolling. And like I said, thinking about different people and different patients and how this could be a game changer for progressing in their health and in their quality of life. So looking forward to Biology of Trauma coming out, 3.0, and then just all of your, your services and programs and how you're helping people. I'm just so grateful. Ah, thank you. Well, I love and respect what you're doing in the world. So thank you for that. And we'll definitely have you back on because I want to go deeper. I want to keep going. Let's do it. With this. 
and, and, and go even deeper. So we'll plan that out. So you guys will definitely be hearing from Dr. Amy again. All right. Thank you so much.